but then in the poem, all you get is I peeled an apple, I called my father, you know, but, but somehow that juxtaposition really works emotionally. Hi everyone, welcome back to Poetology. Today's interview is with the poet Mary Jean Chan, who has written three collections. One was their first pamphlet titled A Hurry of English with Ignition Press, and then a first poetry collection titled Flesh. I've spoken about it on this channel before. It's one of my favorite poetry collections, and it won the Costa Award in, I think, 2019. And the newest collection, Bright Fear, also published with Faber. Mary Jean Chan is a poet, lecturer, editor and critic. And we had a conversation about this collection in particular. So our discussion centered around writing about the COVID pandemic and especially the first lockdowns, growing up queer and migrating to the UK, constructing poems as a kind of home and their relationship to English as a second language. I first met Mary Jean at a poetry school online course titled Queer Studio and met with several poets there and some of us, some of the poets on this course got invited to the festival poetry in Albra later on and we're still friends. So it was nice to come full circle and invite Mary Jean to Poetology. I hope you like this interview. Hi Mary Jean. Hi. Thank you for being here for this interview. We'll be talking about Bright Fear, your latest collection. So that's your second collection. I have the rest here. That was your first pamphlet, A Hurry of English and Flesh, your first collection. So we'll be talking about Bright Fear today. And my first question is, several poems in Bright Fear reflect on the first few months of the COVID pandemic. Why is this an important time to write about and how did you experience it? So I suppose um, it's interesting because I think um, maybe unlike, well, a lot of um, people who have been through the COVID pandemic, I actually experienced, I suppose, one version of it in 2003. So I grew up in Hong Kong um, and in 2003, we had the SARS epidemic. So in fact, when COVID hit, it brought back a lot of memories from my teenage years. And my father is a doctor, but I was made aware of the fact that I hadn't really reflected on that period of my, you know, sort of young adult years, um, when during COVID, actually one of my poems from Flesh, uh, one of the safe space poems where I described the act of washing one's hands, started sort of being shared a bit on social media. And I was very curious as to why that poem sort of was being shared as a poem relevant to our times, and then realized that that was actually a SARS poem. Even though when I wrote it, that was not the intention. Um, so I think that then prompted me to reflect on both SARS and COVID at the same time. Um, and because during the COVID pandemic, I think, you know, a lot of Asian um, communities were facing specific to COVID a sort of anti-racism that was rooted in this idea that COVID began in, in Asia. And that particular period was very uncomfortable and, and distressing for a lot of us, even for those of us who didn't experience overt you know, racism, um, the stories we heard from friends and, you know, other people um, were, were quite horrifying. And I did sort of develop a kind of hypervigilance, personally speaking. Um, and I describe in one of my title poems in Bright Fear, where the speaker wears a staff badge around their neck on public transport mm -hmm. as a way of almost protecting themselves from some kind of potential verbal attack or, or otherwise, you know. And I think that emotional truth was something I wanted to convey um, in my poetry um, that reflected on the, the pandemic. Mm, thank you. And why is it important to write about that time for you? I've read a few books now that do talk about the pandemic, but there are also many writers who seem to just skip over that period of yeah. time. I think it's completely valid for people to decide that that was something they experienced and they don't want to address it in their creative work. I mean, I simply wrote about it because it felt important um, mm. to my, my emotional landscape at the time. And there were things I wanted to say about that period, you know, as a queer person, as a person who is from Hong Kong and specifically to do with the masking and kind of um, initially a lot of skepticism that was sort of directed towards 
people who were already masking before it became more prevalent. Mm. Um, you know, I got some sort of strange questions, even from people who maybe had very benevolent intentions um, as to whether like masking was a cultural thing. And I thought to myself, well, you know, in, in Asia, you know, Southeast Asia, East Asia, it's, it's so hot, like, you know, especially, yeah, in, in places like Hong Kong, Singapore, masking is incredibly uncomfortable. And of course, mm. you only do it when you have to, and, and it's a public health um, safety measure. So I think there was just things I wanted to say, and it felt appropriate to, to address those things in my poetry. Thank you. Some queer writers view English as the language of coming out. So I've heard some poets refer to it as the language of freedom for them. In your poetry, it is also sometimes referred to as a colonial language. So could you talk about your relationship to English and how this and multilingualism is reflected in your writing? Yeah, I think um, my relationship to English is a complex one. Um, I sort of started addressing that in Flesh and then in Bright Fear, I think I thought even more about it. And as with most things, it's not sort of straightforward, oh, you know, English is something I like or dislike. And of course, I, you know, write in English and English is my preferred creative language. I only write poetry in English. That might change in the future, but at the moment it is my only creative language. So I grew up learning English under an educational system that really privileged it, right? So because I sort of was born in 1990 and Hong Kong was still a British colony at the time. So there was a very prevalent sense that English was the preferred language over my mother tongue, Cantonese. Of mm. course that has completely changed, I would say it's changed a lot, and especially in the past few years. Um, but at the time, there was a sense of almost a strange sense of shame, you know, like you, you had to be very good at English. Otherwise, it didn't really matter that you spoke Chinese really well, or that you were very good at Chinese literature, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and I found that very odd, especially growing up. Um, you know, we were all Chinese students in the school that I attended, and yet there was this sense of English being the important or dominant language. Um, and so initially it was imposed. It, it was a sense of there is no choice. You have to master this because all our classes were taught in English. And that means that your academic success hinges on your ability to grasp this language that you might not even speak at home. And I didn't speak English at home. I still don't, you know, it's not a language that I use within the context of family. But of course, I also experienced the other side of things, which is that because English is my second language or it's, you know, I acquired it from a very young age, but it's still, you know, nominally my second language. Um, I felt a freedom that I didn't feel with Chinese. Um, I've mentioned elsewhere that, you know, I encountered Twelfth Night um, and discovered sort of Viola Cesario as a queer character and developed my first literary crush mm -hmm. and realized that you could play with gender, for example, in uh, literary texts in English um, that I had not encountered in Chinese at the time. And also because English was something that I was supposed to be acquiring. I could work very hard at a 12 night essay, you know, and be doing what I was supposed to be doing. And at the same time, be exploring these emergent queer feelings. So I was doing something mm. sort of forbidden, but under the guise of something that was very proper. Um, and that felt very safe and very liberating. Um, and of course, I also fell in love with the language itself. I mm. do adore English. I think, you know, um, I do express myself in ways that I find very liberating. I love the musicality of it. I, I just adore it, you know, as a language. Mm. So it's, it was initially imposed, but I also really chose to sort of develop it further because of course, beyond a certain level, you don't have to keep um, studying literature in English and but I chose to so it's it's a sort of a, a complex uh, situation I guess. Mm, great thank you and in some of your poems especially I think probably more poems in flesh you sometimes do integrate a little bit of Chinese or some Chinese characters in the writing can you talk about this multilingual play and why you sometimes choose to use it? Yeah thank you for that I think um, you know that particular poem that has the most Chinese in it um, written in a historically white space in flesh. I was trying to do something quite specific with the Chinese there. So I personally don't believe in sort of this idea of tokenistically just sprinkling in some Chinese, right? As, as a way of kind of marking out something to do with my ethnicity. Um, but in that particular poem, I was trying to use Chinese as a kind of way of asking the reader to maybe question their own positionality um, if they were frustrated 
by the fact that the Chinese was not translated, where does this frustration come from? Mm -hmm. Does it come from a sense of sort of entitlement that, of course, everything should be translated into English and made transparent? Um, but for people who are bilingual, who can read English and Chinese, then the poem takes on a different meaning, right? There's a kind of duality happening there. Um, they can sort of look at why I've chosen to sort of keep certain words in Chinese, because of course I could have written the whole thing in English. Mm -hmm. um, so what are those particular words doing there in the poem? Um, but also I think for people who don't speak Chinese, um, I've given enough context within the poem for people to actually guess what the Chinese characters mean. Um, so I think it's also quite interesting. People have taught the poem in classes and told me afterwards that people would have guessed something quite close to what the, the word actually means, usually. But if they do manage to look up the word, you know, online or they ask a friend who knows Chinese, then then there is an extra layer there. For example, mm. one of the final Chinese characters means the Great British Empire, when people might guess like UK or something. Right. But of course, if you know it actually says Great British Empire, that has a, a stronger meaning there. Mm. Um, so that particular poem, I, I wanted to almost sort of offer this bilingual reality, which is my reality, mm. to readers and say, meet me halfway. Or if you don't want to meet me halfway, then sort of what what is happening there? You know, because I had to learn English using a dictionary, using a thesaurus. I had to encounter texts in English where there were many, many words I did not know. And mm -hmm. so in some ways that was sort of replicating that that language acquisition process um, a bit in that poem. Um, and then in the other sort of sections, I suppose I do use, for example, section dividers where I don't translate the words, which means mother's story. Um, there's another poem called Speaking in Tongues. It was more of a playful poem. That was less sort of, that was less sort of pointed. It was, Speaking in Tongues was my attempt to rhyme Cantonese words with English words, mm. because Cantonese is a very tonal language. It has nine tones and it's incredibly musical. And then I thought, surely there, there must be sounds in Cantonese that rhyme with English sounds. Um, and then decided that I'd keep keep the Chinese or the Cantonese in it, you know, um, and for those, again, people who specifically know Cantonese, it's it's hopefully a fun and playful poem. Mm. Yeah. Growing up queer in Hong Kong and now living in the UK calls up the difficulty of belonging in any given space, which is also something the collection addresses. So how does that collection of poems speak to various experiences of marginalization? Yeah, I, I think that's that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think the reality is that, you know, one always has to navigate different spaces and even a safe space can prove to be not so safe. So I, I guess by that, I mean, for example, in the poem Sestina in Bright Fear, the speaker is in an ostensibly queer safe space, but realizes that there might be racism happening. Um, mm -hmm. there. So I think this is sort of this idea of intersectionality. And, you know, sometimes, of course, when I go back to Hong Kong, I don't have to think about race, um, because I am mm -hmm. in the racial majority. So I have racial privilege there, or I think less about race, at least, um, with regards to my own reality, of course. Um, but then when I'm in the UK, the fact of my, you know, being eth ethnically Chinese is is suddenly rendered a lot more salient. And I'm made aware of that in, in many different contexts. Um, and I get asked about it in, in ways that sometimes are friendly and sometimes aren't. But then being a queer person feels maybe because of the circles I move in within the UK. Mm. I'm not saying the UK is generally queer friendly. Yeah. Necessarily, it isn't. But there is a, a certain amount of freedom here that I don't experience when I'm back home, even mm. though that is also shifting in Hong Kong. Um, and there are many, many queer writers and activists and people who are doing great work to, you know, make Hong Kong a more inclusive city. Um, so Hong Kong, like, for example, is hosting the gay games, for example, and that's, right. that's pretty big, you know, um, mm. and, and that makes me proud um, and happy to see that. But of course, in terms of actual rights that are afforded by the law, we don't have that in Hong Kong or don't have many rights in Hong Kong as queer people. Mm. Let's move on to the section Ars Poetica in your collection. That section reflects on the constructed space of the poem that constitutes a kind of home. And one of your lines reads, I left home for the poem. Mm -hmm. It made me think of the tension between restraint and self-expression that I see in many of your poems. Um, I wanted to ask what keeps drawing you to poetry as a form. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, I think first and foremost, it's the incredible compression that we find in poetry, the compression of language that is very attractive to me. Um, because I think there is maybe this link between the idea of the home and the idea of the home as, as a space that you can move around in, that you can really make your own, that you can feel safe in. And I often think of a poem as a space that you, in many ways, have full control over, right? You mm -hmm. can decide mm -hmm. whether you want a comma there or a full stop. You can decide where the line break is. You can decide to relineate the entire poem. Um, and often it's it's incredibly compressed. Like even if you write a book length poem, it's still, there's a compression of language that happens in poetry that doesn't really happen in prose in the same way, I don't think. Um, although the prose poem challenges that a little bit, but even so, mm -hmm. Um, I, I'd argue the prose poem is linguistically more compressed. I also think just poetry requires a kind of attentiveness to things like diction and syntax and imagery that again is heightened compared to prose. Um, and I just personally love dwelling on, you know, a single word or a, a particular mm -hmm. metaphor and just really like staring at it for quite some time, you know, and, and asking myself, is this right? Is this the sort of most precise I can be in terms of what I'm trying to convey, right? In terms of color, texture, tone, musicality, like, am I sacrificing mm. image for music or vice versa? And I think if you were to write a novel like that, you could <laughs> I think <laughs> it'd take a lot longer, perhaps. Um, but in poetry, I think there's almost this expectation that you would take such care with words. And I think this idea of being careful with words and careful with language is a really beautiful thing to me, um, because maybe I think that's also a kind of ethics I believe in, like being mm. careful with words and language. Um, to me, it's it's very attractive. Um, so I think in some ways the poem functions as a safe space, as, as a home that one can dwell in. Much of your work turns back towards childhood and the family, especially the mother figure. There is an attempt to address complex familial relationships in order to establish a fuller sense of self. So is the poem a way of grieving or a form of love? Um, yeah, I think uh, for me, I do write a lot about familial relationships. I think it's just something that intrigues me. I love reading work by poets who address the family or the mother figure or the father figure. Mm. This is something I think really, of course, that's one of our first bonds for most people that is a very strong uh lifelong bond and um i think you know i i said in flesh in the preface that this is a book of love poems um mm. so i think for me you know poetry and the poems i've written thus far are in in, in many ways love poems um and of course there's grief you know of course there is disappointment and moments where people hurt one another and the conflict and of course that's why i used the fencing metaphor in flesh this mm. you know the flesh being an attack um but of course there are moments of defensiveness as well uh, with the parry riposte etc and in bright fear there's there's often a lot of fear when you know relationships that you rely on don't work out or mm. you're let down by people you love and you have to grapple with the grief. Um, and I, I think I read somewhere, in some ways, maybe this answers your question, like I read somewhere that grief is love that has nowhere to go. Mm. Grief is love that can't be expressed to that particular person, or maybe in the way that you want to. So in a way, maybe poems that are about grief are also about love inherently, because mm. there is a sense of why can't we love one another well? Right? And, and this spans, you know, romantic relationships, familial relationships, etc. So, yeah, I think as someone who often thinks about relationships and the dynamics that occur between people, the poem, again, functions as a very useful container almost for me to kind of hold all these uh, sort of big emotions. Um, I often think that poetry as a form, again, going back to your maybe earlier question, is this idea that in poems, I think you can put things that don't belong together side by side, right, through juxtaposition or through parataxis, like, you can have things that usually don't go side by side, literally on the same line in, in a novel. And that works in a poem, right? You can go and eat an apple and then have a very difficult conversation with your, you know, father. But then in the poem, all you get is, I peeled an apple, I called my father, you know, but, but somehow that 
juxtaposition really works emotionally. And you don't have to reconcile anything. The poem doesn't have to tell you, oh, the phone call went well, like you're happy again, like you, you mm -hmm. love one another. It can just end with the phone call, for example. Um, and I just, I just love that idea that you can have complex, difficult things put side by side and you don't have to reconcile anything. Whereas I think in a narrative, there needs to be some kind of progression uh, or a bit more than a poem demands perhaps. And so for me, that's very useful as a way of thinking through these dynamics. And, and almost discovering what one thinks and feels as well. Yeah, and I was thinking of what you said earlier about the care you have to put in a poem as also a form of love. Mm. That attention you pay to each word, like attention and care are such important components of love and relationships. Yeah. Great. Can you read us a poem of your choice? Of course. Um... I think given the theme uh, of our conversation, I'll read the postscript of Bright Fear. Great. Postscript. In the penultimate scene where mother and child are listening to one another, speak in spite of everything, the way an orchestra might play on bravely, even when the audience claps before its time, you will want to stay a while in subtropical winter heat. As sunlight blazes through the fog of memory, you begin to wonder if the origin story can at last be transfigured into the version redacted through the centuries, the one in which the garden comes alive, a queer child's vision of paradise where the trees are free to bear their multitudinous light. Thank you, that's beautiful. Thank you. That is it for this interview with Mary Jean Chan. I will put all the contact details below. You can check their website and social media and order their collections. It's so important to actually buy some of these collections from poets. I'd like to thank Mary Jean Chan again for coming to Poetology. And I will see you all again very soon. Bye. <laughs>